John here from bootcamp.com. Welcome to another video. In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at the extra pyramidal tract. So building on those descending motor pathways, which we've been talking about, and looking at some of these extra pyramidal tracts that don't pass through those medullary pyramids. So if you want, you can pause, take a look at the outline, but let's just get started. So starting off first, we have the rubrospinal tract. And if you remember, I told you this tract, uh, it's found just anterior to the lateral corticospinal tract. And it's kind of like holding hands as it descends down the spinal cord. And that's because these two pathways are closely related. So the rubro, as the name kind of implies, starts in the red nucleus. So rubro, red, this is the Latin term for red. So the red nucleus uh, is where the upper motor neuron will be found. And it's then going to immediately decussate and descend down. It's then going to pass through our rubrospinal tract to the level of the spinal cord, which it's then going to leave and innervate those lower motor neurons at that level and then exit out. So this is the pathway that it takes. It originates from the red nucleus, immediately decussates at the level of the red nucleus, and then descends down, passes through the rubrospinal tract, which is found just anterior to our lateral cortical spinal tract. And then it's going to exit and go into the ventral horn where it innervates and stimulates the lower motor neuron, which will then go out to the skeletal muscle. Now, it's not that straightforward. We also have some external input from the globose nucleus and the emboliform nucleus. These are going to provide input to the red nucleus to help modulate it. So the emboliform nucleus and the globose nucleus are both going to provide modulatory stimulation to the red nucleus to make sure it's not providing too much stimulatory output. And this is sensed through proprioceptive information that's coming in through the spinal cord, entering into the cerebellum, stimulating these, and then these will then go on to stimulate a red nucleus. So what is the function of the rubrospinal pathway? Well, this is going to maintain muscle tone in the flexors and it counteracts our extensor muscles. This also plays a role in fine motor control of the upper limb and hand. And if you remember the cortical spinal pathway, that's involved in fine and precise movements of the distal extremities. So this is going to provide contralateral innervation because remember from the red nucleus, it's going to immediately decussate and then descend down. So that's contralateral innervation. Next up, we have the reticulospinal pathways. And these are divided into the medial or the pontine reticulospinal pathway or in the lateral or the medullary reticulospinal pathway. So let's first start off by talking about the medial reticulospinal pathway. This is going to originate at the reticular formation in the portion that is found in our pons. So comes off of the pons, comes off of the reticular formation of the pons, travels through the medial reticular spinal tract, and then comes down, and it's going to stimulate those lower motor neurons in the ventral horn. So you can see, begins at the reticular formation in the pons, descends down through that medial reticular spinal tract, enters the ventral horn, and then that lower motor neuron is going to go and stimulate the target muscles which it innervates. Now, this pathway also receives input from our ascending sensory pathways, both the DCML as well as the spinothalamic. So you can see as these sensory pathways come up, let's say this is the dorsal column medial lemniscal pathway, these are going to provide fibers which is going to go and stimulate that reticular formation to help modulate the output that's coming through the medial reticulospinal tract. Now, what is the function of this pathway? It's going to facilitate movement and increase muscle tone, specifically in the extensor muscles. And this does so on the ipsilateral side. Because if we look at the pathway, you can see it descends and it stays ipsilateral the entire time. 
Whereas in the lateral reticular spinal tract, this is going to aid the medial reticular spinal tract in the sense that it inhibits voluntary movement, reduces muscle tone in the extensors. So if we want to increase muscle tone in the extensors, let's say the extensors on our thigh, our quadriceps, we also want to inhibit muscle tone in our flexors or our hamstrings. So these two pathways are going to be working simultaneously to do so. Remember, they're both coming off of the reticular formation, just at different points. So now let's take a look at the lateral reticular spinal tract. Now the lateral reticular spinal tract originates on the reticular formation in the medullary region. So it's going to originate right here. It's then going to descend down through our lateral reticular spinal tract. It's then going to reach its target level. It's then going to enter into the ventral horn, stimulate those lower motor neurons, and then those lower motor neurons will exit and stimulate those muscles. So you can see here's a lateral reticular spinal pathway originating in the reticular formation of the medulla, descending down through that lateral reticular spinal pathway, reaching its target level, stimulating that lower motor neuron uh, in the ventral horn, and then that's going to go and stimulate the muscles. So what does this receive input from? Remember we had ascending sensory pathways modulating the medial reticular spinal pathway. We also have those same ascending fibers modulating the lateral reticular spinal pathway, but we also have uh, fibers coming from the cortex known as corticoreticular fibers coming down and also helping to modulate the output of this pathway. So you can see we've added these uh, modulatory pathways in. We have our ascending sensory pathway providing that stimulation to the reticular formation. Then we also have fibers coming from the cortex via these corticoreticular fibers coming down and also stimulating the reticular formation, which is going to help modulate that lateral reticular pathway. All right, now let's take a look at the vestibulospinal pathways. Now we have a medial and a lateral vestibulospinal pathway, but that just refers to the part of the vestibular nuclei which they originate off of. They descend down the spinal cord in the same track. So starting off, let's look at the medial vestibulospinal pathway coming off the medial portion of our vestibular nucleus, this is actually gonna give off two branches. So it gives off an ipsilateral branch, which descends down, as well as a contralateral branch, which is also going to descend down on the contralateral side in the vestibulospinal tract. These will then enter into the ventral horn and stimulate the lower motor neuron in there. And then our lateral vestibulospinal tract, this is going to originate on that lateral vestibular nucleus found right here. And it comes down, passes through that vestibulospinal tract, and also exits and enters into the ventral horn to stimulate those lower motor neurons. So the lateral vestibulospinal tract, this is going to be ipsilateral innervation to the lower motor neuron whereas the medial vestibulospinal tract, this is going to be bilateral innervation because we have the splitting and the bilateral innervation on both sides. Now the vestibular nucleus is also going to receive that external input to help modulate the activity. The input is going to be coming from the macula, from the utricle and saccule, and the crista ampullaris from the semicircular canal. And these signals are traveling through that vestibulocochlear nerve Remember, that's coming from the ear as well as our equilibrium center in our temporal bone. And that information is being carried back to our vestibular nucleus to stimulate it and modulate the output from these vestibulospinal tract pathways. We also have input coming from the vestigial nucleus, which is another deep cerebellar nuclei. Remember we talked about the globus and the emboliform nucleus. Those are deep cerebellar nuclei. The vestigial nucleus is also a deep cerebellar nuclei, which is going to act to input and help modulate the vestibular nucleus as well. So what is the function of this pathway? Well, it's going to increase 
anti-gravity muscle tone in accordance with the head movements. So when you're turning your head, your body needs to make these adjustments so that signal is being picked up by the macula and by the crista ampullaris, and it's modulating the vestibular nucleus, and then the output is coming down to help modulate and refine those neck and posture movements. And this is specifically going to be the extensor muscles in the limbs. And remember, the medial reticular spinal tract also is involved with the extensor muscles in the limbs. So these two pathways kind of work together in that sense. Now, what happens if we have damage to both of these pathways, well, you get something known as decerebrate rigidity, which is a continuous state of contraction in the extensor muscles. So the extensor muscles are gonna be continuously extended, and there's gonna be a rigidity in the movements whenever a patient tries to move. And then finally, let's talk about the last pathway in the extrapyramidal pathway. And this is gonna be the tectospinal pathway. Now the tecto refers to originating from the tectum. And if you remember, uh, in the tectum, that's where we're gonna have our superior and inferior colliculi. So the tectospinal pathway, it's gonna originate in the superior colliculus, then immediately decussates and descends down. And it passes through our tectospinal tract. This is gonna be the most anterior tract in that anterior column, then reaches its target level and enters the ventral horn to stimulate the lower motor neurons, which will then go and stimulate the muscle. So let's draw that out. Now the tectospinal tract is also receiving external input from visual information coming from the optic nerve. Because remember, the superior colliculus is involved in visual reflexes. Now the function of the tectospinal tract is reflexive movements of the head, eyes, and trunk in response to visual and auditory stimulation. So remember that this is a contralateral pathway because right at that level of superior colliculus, that is where we're gonna see that decussation before it descends down uh, the tectospinal tract to its target spinal level. But anyways, that's it for today's video. Please, if you guys ever have any questions, always feel free to reach out to us. We'd love to help uh, solidify your understanding with this material. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that and I'll see you all in the next one.